In this series, I'll be bringing you up to speed with all the latest technological breakthroughs transforming the future for armed forces across the world. Coming up on the show. Unsure what lies ahead, how an ingenious combination of 3D video and drone technology can offer infantry soldiers a more precise picture of the battleground. It's the mini Hoover that could save the lives of injured soldiers. We bring you the device which salvages lost blood and returns it to the casualty. Inspired by nature, but made for the 21st century, the mini submarine that could keep the world's ports safer. During the recent conflict in Afghanistan, soldiers faced huge risks when entering a village or compound. They could be attacked by hidden enemies or set off improvised explosive devices. But unmanned aerial vehicles or drones could offer infantry troops enhanced intelligence and protection. As Charlotte Banks reports, an award-winning team at the University of Birmingham has been pioneering the combination of 3D video technology with drones to create a more complete and revealing picture of the battle space. Birmingham University's human interface technologies team use virtual reality, simulations and software to look forward 20 years into the future. They want to see what might be possible in 2035 and beyond. Drones are set to become a bigger part of the military world, but one thing they're on the verge of doing is generating 3D video, something the army doesn't yet have, but that could prove very useful. This is the replica Afghan village at Thetford, which will be familiar to the thousands of troops who did their training here before deploying to Helmand. That campaign might be well in the past, but today the village is helping to develop the technology of the future. This is a standard off-the-shelf drone, which might not look like much, but combine it with some advanced software and you've got a powerful surveillance tool in your hands. Chris is programming the, uh, the drone to adopt a scanning pattern on the second part of the Afghan village. We've scanned the first part uh, and now what he's doing is he's setting all the GPS coordinates so that the drone can take off, adopt the starting position and then do a kind of zigzag or raster scan uh, and then in doing that it'll be able to take sort of snapshots. Every time the drone takes a new snapshot it adds a GPS tag using its altitude and position. Using that data and some clever software, the team produce a 3D model of the area they've just scanned with the drone. The model is accurate to within a centimetre. So what we're trying to do is use the drone to be able to build up 3D areas uh, and demonstrate this idea of a, of a sacrificial drone in the future, bringing something down, scanning an area at very high speed with limited battery and possibly small arms fire, and then using that to build, build more accurate 3D representations of what's actually there. It's technology that could one day be useful in combat. Eventually, in real time, if it's flying over, for example, to try and find out where people are, um, whether there's disturbed areas on the ground, and um, give the troops a, a more situational awareness of where they are on the ground. The more remote our armed forces get from the, from the action, from the surveillance, from the intelligence gathering, the more or the higher quality of information they're going to demand before they can make, make you know, quite significant decisions on, on what they're going to take out and what they're going to observe in more, data, in more detail. For the time being, this technology is in the early stages and this is just an experiment. It takes hours to generate the 3D model today, but the troops of the future will see it in real time. How will technology transform future combat and how might the military adapt? As you can imagine, these are vital questions faced by forces around the world and some of the largest defence companies are trying to come up with the answers. One of the leading players is Northrop Grumman. In an exclusive for the military tech show, Dr Andrew Tyler, the Briton who heads up the US defence giant's European operations, sets out his predictions. There's a clear view emerging now in countries like the United States and increasingly European countries 
that we've reached a new moment in the history of military technologies where our adversaries, the, the major powers such as Russia and China, but also increasingly some of those near peer adversaries, now have got many of the same technologies as we have on the battlefield. So this view has given rise to thinking about what is the next generation of technologies. They're going to re-establish that difference, that military superiority on the battlefield that comes through the technologies that we use. So let's examine some of the technologies that I would expect to become very, very widely used in the battle space of the future. Intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance has been a feature of the battle space since the dawn of time. But I think we're going to enter into an age of what I call intel-centric warfare, where the gathering of intelligence is incredibly central to everything that goes on in the battlefield. That ability to know what is going on. Sometimes I describe this as eyes on, hands off. The underwater environment, for me, represents the last hiding place on the planet. Today we can see everything that's going on on the surface of the planet. You think about what you can see just on Google Earth. In the air, our ability to detect what is going on in the air is increasing faster than our ability to hide in the air. But underwater, this still remains a, a cloak, a cloak of invisibility, where we can hide the assets that we need to use against our adversaries. So my forecast is that we're going to see a real resurgence in underwater technologies over the coming years. And we're going to be using these technologies to gather intelligence, do reconnaissance, deploy special packages, and potentially to deliver lethal force if necessary. When the United States went to war in Afghanistan, it's estimated they had about 100 unmanned air systems in their infantry. By the time we finished in Afghanistan, there were well over 10,000 deployed in that theatre. My prediction in the future is that drones will become a fundamentally intrinsic part of the battle space. What we haven't seen pervasively on the battle space today is unmanned combat air vehicles. But we've seen demonstrators like the Northrop Grumman X-47B, BAE Systems Tirana system. And those are signposting what we expect to see in the future. Combat drones able to go and gather intelligence, surveillance, acquire targets, and if necessary, strike targets, all with a huge degree of stealth, long range, and persistence. One of the really interesting challenges we have at the moment is something called the tanker tether problem. One of the features of combat aircraft is that they're not known for their fuel economy. And their range is normally only a few hundred miles without the need to refuel. And they will refuel from a large aircraft flying around in an orbit, a tanker, from which they then go and take their fuel to continue their mission. So the ability for us to use our combat aircraft relies on our ability to refuel them. And if your enemy can shoot down your tanker, that will neutralise your combat air effect. One of the ideas that's being looked at at the moment is the unmanned tanker drone. So this would get around the problem of this very large aircraft being used for refuelling but is much more vulnerable to missile attack. This would be a drone aircraft with a low radar signature, able to persist in the sky for very, very long periods of time. One of the things that I think has tantalised us over many years is the idea of wearable technologies. But I really think that we've got to a point in time now where these are becoming an everyday reality. So at the high end, let's look at the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter helmet. This incredible device worn by the pilot brings together six camera systems, brings together a targeting system, brings together missile warners and communication systems. And it brings all this together in the pilot's view, allowing the pilot, for example, to look anywhere around him or her and to be able to see straight through the sides of the aeroplane, unencumbered by the aeroplane structure. At the low end, let's think about the sort of technologies that the soldier of the future might be using. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have the soldier equivalent of the F-35 pilot's helmet. It may not be something they wear on their head, it might be something presented on a tablet. But it would have that same ability to bring different sources of information together. Cyber is the revolutionary new frontier in warfare. But the fact is that a cyber attack can change its nature and its form and the method by which it's delivered it can be changed in a matter of days, perhaps even hours. 
The sort of things I think we're going to see in the future are using active cyber as a means of enhancing your own defence. Being able to put cyber modules out on the network that monitor and listen and give you that early warning of attack and gather intelligence on where cyber threats may be posed to your nation. When I look at the battle space of the future and I look across the range of technologies that we're going to see in that battle space, everything from drones to ground robots to cyber, there are certain enabling technologies which I see as very common to be used across that spectrum. So for example, autonomy. We're seeing it already in our, in our personal lives. We're seeing cars with a degree of autonomy that we've not seen before. And you can see whether it's an unmanned ground robot being sent to defuse an IED, or on the other end of the spectrum, an unmanned combat aircraft that's being sent to prosecute an attack mission on another state. Autonomy is a very, very important technology. Well, that is it for part one, but join us after the break when we learn about the extraordinary blood salvaging device set to improve an injured soldier's chance of survival and the two-man submarine that could be the key to deep ocean security. Hello, welcome back to the Military Tech Show, bringing you the latest developments in defence technology. Forces medics and researchers are constantly trying to improve field treatment capability to give injured troops on the ground even more of a fighting chance. One of the biggest causes of death is severe blood loss following a traumatic injury. But now scientists at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland have developed a portable blood salvaging device. Deployable in the field, the machine can return blood loss back to the casualty as we find out it could improve the chances of survival for severely wounded soldiers. One of the biggest challenges faced by injured military personnel in the field is hemorrhage and um, it's very difficult to transport significant volumes of blood into the battlefield. We have considerable experience in developing a technique called autotransfusion for the clinical field, that's the civilian clinical field. And through that development, we developed the hemocep system. Um, so it occurred to us that it would be valuable to develop a military derivative of that. So we determined to design a, te a technology that was manually powered, um, that was light, portable, and simple to use. Well, this is our field deployable uh, portable auto transfusion kit. Uh, it weighs, it's quite a small package, weighs about one and a half kilos. We take a look inside here. We've got the main drive mechanism, which is a dual headed hand cranked pump. We've got a low level anticoagulant, which uh, stops the blood from clotting within the tubes. And we've got a blood collection bag, which stores the blood that's been collected from the wound site. The, the, the centre of the whole technology is, is this. It's a, um, a double-headed roller pump system with a single crank, so that both pumps are driven from a single shaft. But we can activate the second pump independently, so we can decide when that's going to run and when it's not going to run. So the top pump is a high-volume pump that provides a vacuum. So it sucks through this line, so we have a a conventional suction wand here that we would put into the wound and we would suck that blood back through this pump and into a holding reservoir, this blood collection reservoir. When we have sufficient volume in that reservoir, we will activate the pump on the bottom simply by twisting the case, continue to crank the single shaft and the blood will be transferred from here directly back into the patient. We would hope in the long term that it would have a considerable impact on the uh, number of, of uh, injured military personnel who succumb to hemorrhage. And we know that's a significant number. And we would hope that deploying this new technology, this simple autotransfusion technology, will have a very positive impact uh, on, on that number of casualties.
Next, a transport at the cutting edge of patrol vehicle technology that provides unprecedented levels of blast protection for its size and weight. It's been specifically designed and built in Britain and will be a mainstay in the army for years to come. So what is the Foxhound? Killer whales, orcas, they're among the most feared animals in the world, but also the most impressive. If you wanted inspiration for a submersible, they're not a bad place to start, as an American company have been demonstrating. John Joe, tell me more about the orca sub. Okay, so the orca sub takes advantage of a unique hull design. You can't tell, but underneath this fiberglass body are two individual pilot-shaped pressure hulls. They're almost shaped like shoes. They're only as big as they need to be to keep each pilot perfectly comfortable and contain the electronic equipment that he needs to do his job. So by having this small, uh, very efficient cockpit design, it means we don't need to have an enormous amount of weight to make this thing, make it sink. And uh, by having it shaped like a torpedo, it means that we don't need an enormous amount of power to make it go fast and be efficient. So, okay, so, so give me some technical specifications. Give me some figures. All right, so each pilot has about 80 hours of life support, which is much longer than you want to be seated in this submarine. But it's helpful if you ever get into trouble, you need time to, to fix that trouble. 80 hours is uh, a lot of time to solve any problem that you might have. Um, it has 22 kilowatt hours of power through lithium ion batteries. So this allows it to have a range over 10, 20, 30 miles. A very unique for a small submersible. Uh, applications, what, what can it be used for? For reconnaissance, uh, for surveillance, uh, security, uh, port security. And it has the ability to do all these things in a way uh, that doesn't advertise the fact that you're doing it. So, Sometimes, uh, if you're interested in doing ship hull inspections, for example, with an ROV, that requires you to have a surface vessel nearby and somebody gazing into a screen, you know, moving an ROV around, and everybody knows that you're doing it. Uh, by contrast, we can do that clandestinely. Go underneath the ship hull, we have eyes on the prize. If anything uh, is there that's not supposed to be there, we can back up, check it out, shoot more video beam it with sonar, uh, and then go away without anybody knowing that we found something that, that we're interested in. You mentioned it earlier, but tell me more about this, this fantastic sleek shape. Why is that so important? Well, we all know that um, sharks are fast and torpedoes are fast. It's because of their shape. They're long. And uh, this allows water to flow uh, across. And, and with a very little input, you can maintain that, that sort of speed very efficiently. The least efficient thing to move through the water is a giant sphere, which unfortunately is what most small submersibles look like. So there are these spheres that have thrusters pointed in all directions to make them go up and down. Uh, and they don't have much range because it actually requires a lot of power. And if there's anything like a current running, well then you're, you're even you know, more out of luck. But this can head into a three knot current, no problem. Uh, and you're basically using your main thrusters to power and you're using these flight surfaces the bank and turn, which is super efficient. You don't have to have thrusters you know, counteracting you or pushing you aside. Uh, so this is what gives it the super range and the super speed. I guess another uh, thing that most people want to know is how deep will it go? Uh, we have three models. Uh, the shallowest is good for 2,000 feet. We have a mid-range model that's good for 3,000 feet and a super deep model for 6,000 feet. 
So uh, quite a lot of depth for a small sub. And at those kind of depths, what are, you, what are you using this for? What can you do? Well, you can do a lot of you know, science, you can do exploring, uh, but one of the most important things from a defense point of view is maintenance, for example, of uh, a SOSIS lines, or you want to make sure that your communication cables uh, aren't being hacked uh, by somebody, uh, uh, pipeline uh, security, all kinds of national infrastructure uh, exists at depth uh, going across the Atlantic, uh, and it's important to maintain them and make sure nobody is uh, uh, up to something they shouldn't be. Obviously it has very serious and important applications and implications, but it also looks like it might be quite a lot of fun. How well trained do you have to be to get in it and have a go? Well, the joke we have is that I can train you to fly this uh, badly in about 20 minutes. And how, you, how long would it take you to train me to fly it well? Well, that depends on you. We found that uh, in training pilots, one of the common factors for one reason or another is if you're a motorcyclist, you pick up this really, really quickly because something about learning the, to turn, look, lean, uh, is, is just generic to understanding how to fly this well. But basically, if you can play a video game... I can do that. ...then you can get this really easily. Okay, and last question, how much would this set me back? So this model, this is a, a copy of our 2,000 foot uh, depth model. Uh, we can put together with you, all included with sonar and communications and everything you could possibly need for under three million US. Okay, we might have to shave off some extras, but it doesn't sound too bad. John Joe, thank you. You're welcome, thanks Matt. The USS Zumwalt is one of the most modern and impressive ships in the world. The $4 billion guided missile destroyer has some of the world's newest weapons aboard and is ready to operate the next generation, such as rail guns and weaponized lasers, when they're ready. Well, the ship has recently been delivered to the US Navy and the only journalist who's been aboard at sea is Christopher Cavus, the Naval Warfare Correspondent of Defense News. He joins me now on the program. Thank you very much for being with us, Christopher. Tell us your first impressions of the vessel. Well, you know, the ship actually is, she really is a big ship. It is a cruiser-sized ship. It's 600 feet long. It's, it'll be 16,000 tons. And it's a, just a much bigger ship than what we've been on before. It's also uh, a ship that's unlike any other that's been built. It is not a ship, for example, that you go outside, topside on. So the, the crew really stays inside the entire time. There are a number of new technologies. How do the trials go? And talk us through some of that new tech. The trials seem to have gone remarkably well uh, for a ship that is full of new technologies. Just about everywhere you look, there's something, there's a different way of doing things on the Zumwalt. We mentioned earlier, it looks like a, something out of a science fiction film. Just how much of a leap have we made here? She represents the epitome of stealth design. So she carries fewer missile cells than the destroyers that are in service right now, for example. But there are other technologies in there that are not present anywhere else. Uh, the two of the most uh, obvious are the advanced gun systems, 155 millimeter uh, guns that two of them fitted forward this in an uh, automatic magazine. So nobody touches the, wet, the, uh, the shells that go into these guns, but they're very large. It's all automatic. These are the largest guns fitted on the ship since World War II. And, and there are two of them. They're on the center line forward, so they eat up the center line space that in most other ships is eaten up by vertical launch systems. So the launch systems in this ship have been pushed out to the peripherals along the sides of the ship. And that's exactly what the launch system is called, the peripheral vertical launch system. What was security like? Virtually the entire uh, interior of the ship is considered a classified um, area. I was allowed to take pictures inside the ship, and so far I have the only releasable interior views of the ship. What do they show? I couldn't take pictures of the of the bridge, which is a shame, because the bridge is really, it's super cool. It's like something out of Star Trek. And there's also a, a mission control center, which is one of the main features of this ship. And it's a very large command and control space. It's actually two stories high. Elsewhere on the ship, there's a large passageway inside the ship along the starboard side. It's called Broadway, and this is to make it easier to move large pallets of food, of ammunition, of anything else and equipment fore and aft on the ship. You can drive a forklift up and, up and down it. All the way aft the ship is a boat bay. The bay can hold two 11-meter ribs for special operations, and actually in front of the, just as forward of the boat bay, is a special compartment area for 14 SEALs 
they can move directly into the boats. There's a cradle that lifts up and tilts, and, and, and uh, then the boats launch and recover through the stern transom. Uh, above that, of course, is the, the flight deck, but then forward to that is, a, is the hangar. The hangar is very large, much larger than uh, you might expect. It's not only uh, wide, but it's also very high. They'll, they'll be able to carry several helicopters, unmanned vehicles in there, like Fire Scout. Other things, the advanced induction motors. This is an all-electric drive ship. Um, much more uh, power than anything has ever had before, 78 megawatts. And it being an integrated power system, what that means is that most ships, there's, there's a propulsion system which has a lot of power, and then there's a hotel system, if you will, that provides power to, to run the ships, all the ship systems inside, including the weapons and the radars, but also the lights and everything else. I might, might want to be doing a fire control mission, use my rail guns. I can now direct all that power that would have gone to the propulsion system and direct it into the weapon. So it's something like on the old Star Trek when they would shoot a photon torpedo and everything would like, they'd shoot it and go dark boom as the thing would shoot something like that i don't know if they'll go dark or not but the point is you can use all this power in the ship and 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 adjust it to different areas where you might want to use it that's very new but wherever you go on the ship you're aware of the great electrical power uh, that is that is on hand here and this this is really a major leap forward both in terms of engineering and in terms of operating Providing a Challenger 2 tank for soldiers of armoured battalions isn't always possible during their training or while on exercise. There can be budget implications and logistical challenges, but a British firm is hoping they've come up with an ingenious solution. They've developed a low-cost, immersive and realistic simulation system called Thunderbird, and it's being backed by government funding. As I find out, it's designed to operate in a standard 4x4 vehicle, but using virtual reality technology transforms it into a 60 ton war machine. So Paul, it, it feels like a tank. There are elements of it that look like a tank. We're obviously not in the tank. Just talk us through what we are in. Thunderbird is a, a armoured vehicle part task trainer. Um, in this instance, it's simulating a Challenger 2 uh, tank. Um, you, as the vehicle gunner, are able to interact with what is a real set of uh, Challenger 2 tank uh, gunner controls, um, and you're able to view on a screen the uh, optics and sights that you would be familiar with for, for what you operate inside that Challenger tank. So essentially we're in a, a simulator that moves, what are, what are the benefits of that? It allows the crew to develop those skill sets uh, in terms of um, how a gunner will uh, interact with the, with the commander and interact with the, the driver of the vehicle. And I guess it's, it's slightly closer to real life because they're dealing with the elements and the weather and that kind of thing, how does that benefit them? It allows uh, that, that very le realistic level of training on a military training area when they want to conduct that kind of level of training. And I guess there's, the, there's a cost element as well, there's a saving to be made, isn't there? It's much cheaper, of course. Um, you know, the saving on track mileage, the kind of equipment is readily available uh, and it saves the whole booking process of getting the vehicles out of uh, storage out of the um, vehicle sheds and actually put them onto the train area. Okay, so that's what it's for. Well, let's just have a think about how it works. Ollie, our driver, if you want to hop out, let's have a chat around the back of the vehicle. So Ollie, we're out amongst the elements, bit of breeze, some nice sunshine. Just tell us how all this works. Okay, so basically what we've done is we've taken a standard set of uh, part task trainer gunner and commander controls for a Challenger 2. We've put them in the back of a commercial 4x4 vehicle, could be any vehicle, doesn't have to be this particular one here. But what we're doing that's clever is we are taking this vehicle and using a clever piece of kit that's in the back of here to effectively put this vehicle on a geo-referenced terrain database in the virtual environment so that the crew can train in the live environment and the virtual environment simultaneously at the same time. So it's about mixing the real and the virtual. Just, just show us the kit. What have we got in here? Okay, so in the back of this vehicle is the clever bit of box of tricks that makes it all work. I've got to be honest, I was expecting more. It's a little disappointing. Little things can, be, can provide an awful <laughs> lot of capability. What we've that's, got? that's effectively what we've got in here. So in this box, 
you've got a router, you've got a couple of batteries that power it so it'll work even when the vehicle's on or off, but actually the clever bit is beneath the skin. So underneath this lid here, that is a high spec inertial navigation uh, suite that basically puts this vehicle, position this vehicle very accurately into the simulated environment. And what that means is, as this vehicle drives down this track in the real world, an avatar of this vehicle, so the tank that you're trying to simulate, is driving down the same track in the virtual environment in that geo-reference terrain database. So it's very important from a, a crew perspective because the driver, he is always operating in the real environment. He's control, in control of a real vehicle. Safety is one of the most important things for him to take care of. The gunner and commander in the back of the vehicle, they're operating in both the live and the virtual environment. So it's very important from crew interaction perspective that the two environments are blended seamlessly. So when this vehicle pulls up to a junction in the real world, the avatar of this, of this vehicle, it needs to pull up to exactly the same junction in the virtual environment at the same time. So the commander, for example, can instruct the driver, turn left at this junction. So uh, really, we need to have a bit more of a go, really. Can we, can we fire up a mission and Absolutely. give it a whirl? That's what we're here for. Let's crack okay. on. OK. Great. So Paul, we're now in, in mission mode, as it were. What have I got to do? To uh, traverse the, the turret and the barrel is you need to, with your right hand, there's a paddle behind you, you need to pull that in and concurrently use your thumb on the little thumb dial there to move the barrel. And that then moves left down, up right, or in uh, targeting speech, we traverse right, we traverse left, we depress the barrel, which is down, or we elevate the barrel, which is up. And what you'll see come into, uh, into view is a small tree line. That's a small tree line directly over in front of the vehicle now. If you now traverse to the right, uh, keep traversing right, the, the more you uh, hold down on the uh, thumb dial, the faster it will go. You'll see the, again, you'll see the tree lines coming into view. As you continue to traverse right, you'll see the tree line in the distance As. now coming into view. So those, that's those trees over there? And that's a tree line over our shoulder to the right there that you can see in the distance. Okay, so and I can see it over by those tree lines something that looks like vehicles or... Okay, so take the central uh, red circular dot, which is called the MBS, the main battle site, um, and position that broadly in the position of the, uh, of, of the vehicle that you can see. Once you've done that, press the mag button on your left hand side there okay. and that will zoom in your sights. Ah. That will allow you to acquire in more detail and finally position the, the battle site. What you then need to do is move your left thumb from the mag button to the laze. What you'll do is press it upwards and it'll laze and it'll give us a range. Okay. The fire control system has acquired the target. What you need to do then is simultaneously ensure that the, the button on the right hand is depressed and then to fire the, uh, the gun is yeah. to also depress the button on the left hand side. Okay, can I, can I fire now then? Yep, you can indeed. Okay, so you, you'll notice there, ah. fire, direct hit, and the enemy vehicle has burst into flames. So that was that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Yeah, not bad. First attempt. First attempt. Excellent. Well done. Definitely enemy that, wasn't it? Definitely enemy indeed. <laughs> well, that's it for part one. Coming up, the reconnaissance vehicle that's been developed with special forces in mind. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the bomb disposal robot simulator created by a team of university researchers. Hello, welcome back to the Military Tech Show, bringing you all the latest innovation in defence technology. Now, without doubt, one of the most important pieces of kit for land forces is their transport vehicle. Some patrol and are heavily protected against the dangers of improvised explosive devices. Others are faster and easily adaptable for specialist operations. Well, the LRV 400 Mark II, designed by British company Supercat, is a high-performance off-road reconnaissance vehicle that's been developed with special forces in mind. Rebecca Ricks put it through its paces at its test track in Devon. There's something happening in the country lanes of Devon. Oh. 
A brand new LRV or long range vehicle is being put through its paces. It could become the transport of choice for our special forces. Protecting British soldiers in Afghanistan was its big brother, the Jackal. Over a thousand were produced, and they hope this latest addition to the family will be just as popular. This is the HMT 400, and that's the High Mobility Transporter. It's a reconnaissance vehicle, and it's better known to you and me as the Jackal. And it was absolutely vital to our troops in Afghanistan. But come and meet its little brother. This is the LRV 400. It's aimed at special forces, and like with any sibling rivalry, just don't call it little. Because this Mark II version is a tough, high-speed, high-mobility off-road vehicle designed for rapid intervention and multi-terrain special ops. What it may lack in protective armour, it makes up with firepower, and smoke canisters allow for rapid withdrawal. The gruesome threat to the driver of a wire across the road is taken care of by a cutter. And with an operational payload of 1.7 tonnes, its fuel tank has a range of 800 kilometres. It also has a raised air filter to avoid deep water wading, and in a clever twist, it can convert from a 4x4 to a 6x6. We've got this unique feature by which we can bolt on, unbolt the back end of the of the vehicle and bolt on a third axle. That gives us around about another tonne to tonne and a half payload on there. Um, and we increase the mobility when it's, in its, when it's got the six wheels or the three axles on there by having all six wheels driven. Special forces need speed and stealth. The LRV 400 can swoop down from the skies. That was a key requirement for us really, as it needs to be narrow enough to fit inside the back of a CH-47 Chinook helicopter. We designed it specifically so that it could be landed in a Chinook ramps come down and it can drive out ready to go straight into action with no modifications required. In special ops, you could need to get out of trouble fast. But thanks to its V6 turbo engine with 256 brake horsepower, that's not a problem. Even at full weight, it can go from 0 to 60 miles per hour in under 15 seconds, leaving its big brother trailing. A fast road out isn't always an option. Sometimes the terrain is more challenging. I climb on board with Chief Demonstration Driver Nigel Platt. So with Nigel, he's agreed to take me for a drive around the test track here, just outside the Supercat headquarters. We've got some obstacles coming up ahead. What have we got here first? Right, come on now, we've got some really sharp offset concrete blocks, which is going to test the steering, the suspension, and also the traction control of the vehicle. The LRV 400's front and rear double air suspension smooths a bumpy ride. The Ministry of Defence helped test the vehicle's robustness. These obstacles were designed in partnership with the MOD as a sort of terrain that the MOD would like the vehicles tested over, because this is the sort of terrain that they would actually be driving and used on. And how testing is it on the vehicle? Is this hard work for it? It's hard work for the vehicle. We'll, we'll almost test it to destruction at times driving faster than you normally would do. And then with the MOD, we'll then give a recommendation on the sort of speed you should be driving at. Well, that was great, Nige. Any chance I can give it a go? I don't see why not. Let's do this. Put your foot on the brake. On the brake. Select V for drive. And, and off we're we ready go. To go. <laughs> There's no hazards at the bottom. No. Get your foot off the brake. And let's go. A little bit of throttle now. Here we go. The thing about the LRV is it's got a 1.7 ton payload, which is an awful lot for a vehicle of this size. You can really understand why the special forces might go for it.
and after a busy day driving around the LRV 400, you need a cup of tea. And this handy boiling unit helps. How'd you take your tea, Nigel? That please, Becky. Perfect. And there's even a handy cup holder. Cheers. Cheers. Finally, a high-tech bomb disposal robot developed by the UK's Ministry of Defence has helped soldiers find and deactivate dangerous explosives on the front line. But it's a highly expensive piece of technology and troops have been nervous about damaging it during their training. So a team of experts at the University of Birmingham have helped solve the problem by developing a portable simulated version of the robot, as Charlotte Banks explains. The Army's bomb disposal robots are controlled remotely, sent out to take a closer look at a device while avoiding danger to human life. The operator remains a safe distance away, using a command and control unit with a camera feed to operate the robot. But these are expensive machines. The most sophisticated robot, called the Cutlass, cost around a million pounds each. So learning how to use it is tricky because you really don't want to damage it during training. The Human Interface Technologies team at Birmingham University has developed a solution. They devised a cutlass training simulator. We can provide the trainees with access to a very high detailed, high fidelity model of the robot and the robot arm that they're able to uh, experiment with, uh, to learn how to drive. We're able to let them experiment with all the different methods and quirks of driving the cutlass vehicle before they put their hands on the real thing. Because obviously if they make a mistake in this, it's far less expensive than if they make a mistake with, with, with the, real, the, the real system. So here we have the uh, cutlass operator interface that you would normally see in the back of the, of the van itself. And then we can simulate the view that the driver or the robot operator would actually see. So we've got two windows and we've got complete flexibility over the kind of cameras so for example, I can turn it to the weapon camera, so you can see the view from the weapon, or we can see the view from the search camera. The simulator has presets for common moves, so the joints don't always need to be controlled one by one. If I select preset by touching the screen, what's happening now is the robot arm is unfolding and is getting itself set up to look into a car window. But with this, they can actually select one of the more common positions just by selecting preset. The simulator proves that small teams can deliver quickly, cheaply and effectively. And that is it for now. We hope you've enjoyed watching the Military Tech Show. Until next time, goodbye.